Well, good morning, everyone. It's just about precisely 11 o'clock, and we like to get started on time. We like to end on time, uh, and I always like to do a little welcome and introduction. I'm Rick Bushnell, and I was a former president of the Foundation of the Arts and Sciences and chair of what we now call the uh, Stewardship Committee. Uh, welcome. Uh, and uh, we have a, a, a very interesting session today. I like to pull everything together because, as we've said in the past, everything is connected. And certainly the weather is uh, one of the things that connects everything together. So we've got a very interesting talk today. I want to start off by thanking Daniela Kerner, uh, Jenna, and Kate, uh, LBI staff, and Daniela Kerner is the executive director for inviting us and supporting these sessions. Um, they've been they've been a great year. Uh, they've been great over the past few years, as a matter of fact, that I've been involved anyhow. And so we certainly want to thank them and ask those of you who are on the call, and you've probably heard this before, if it's your first time, you haven't heard it, but the best thing that you can do is help support the foundation. Certainly, donations are great, memberships wonderful, but they have terrific programs all summer long, summer camp for the kids and, and those kinds of things. So just by enjoying the foundation and going to the various events and activities that they have, you can support them. They have a terrific catalog, and the catalog will be online, certainly, but also in hard copy. And the hard copy is going to be available about Memorial Day, so you can see all the different things that are going on. Uh, another thing that I've said in the past is that it is kind of interesting that we call this planet Earth when it's really more than 75% water, but uh, the water is what circulates and all of our life is related really to the water and a lot of that water comes out of the sky so that's that's how i see things connected with our with our presentation today so we like to think that uh, art and science are related and they're related by observation and observation on the part of an artist is how do i recreate what i'm seeing in some form dance music uh, art um, graphics art those kinds of things, but then it's also recreational. So we like to learn, learn about our environment so we can better care for our environment. And that's really the, the theme of these sessions that we've been going through. We've got um, uh, Darlene Cavalier back. She was traveling. And uh, if you may remember Caroline, her one of her uh, um, cohort <laughs> um, was talking about SciStarter and helping us relate some of the things that we're learning with things that are available for us as citizen scientists to get involved. And you'll be hearing more about that with the, with the weather today. So I'm going to um, just remind people that we, we have a new capability that Michael has brought with him, and it's called this Slido or Slido which is a capability for you to interact with him directly during his presentation. And you can do so by scanning the QR code in the upper left hand of your screen with your phone. And that'll put you right into, essentially into his presentation. So it's a terrific uh, new thing. We also, for those of you who don't care to do that, but may have a question, we'll be using the chat feature. So you can still, same old, uh, same old, boy, this is not that old, <laughs> same mm -hmm. method of communicating using, using chat. So a little by way of introduction, um, uh, Michael uh, Fulmer is a local guy. He grew up in Tom's River and has been very involved with uh, John Wenick over at Mates. If you remember Mates, uh, we've had talks from, uh, from a number of people, and that's the Marine Academy for Technology and Environmental Sciences. And he predated that, uh, that um, county uh, established capability and uh, been involved in weather uh, a, a great deal. So currently he is the National Weather Service Ocean Prediction Center. Uh, it's where he works. And he's very involved in the Impact-Based Decision Support Services, IPIDSS. And that's, he'll explain more deeply, but that's providing the information to the United States Coast Guard, to our uh, cruise lines, to cargo uh, shippers, 
and to everyday mariners like myself, especially those that go beyond 60 miles, uh, 60 mile nautical miles offshore. So he's got a great deal of knowledge and his session is going to have two parts. He'll talk about those things, but then he's also going to describe how this Jersey Shore uh, Mesonet, which he'll explain what that means, provides information about the weather so that we can all learn from it and all be better informed, especially when things <laughs> things go sour on us. So uh, without further ado, I'll turn things over uh, to Michael. Welcome. All right. Thank you, Rick, for uh, such a nice introduction. Uh, welcome, everybody. I am going to cover a lot of information in a short amount of time, but I hope it's uh, very interesting and relevant uh, to hopefully most of your lives. I think the weather, uh, we can all agree, is pretty relevant to all of our lives, uh, whether we like it or not. Uh, as stated, I invite you to either use the QR code in the upper left uh, to participate in the presentation along with me. I'll have multiple questions scattered throughout. Uh, it'll keep you on your toes. You'll never know when a question is about to show up. Uh, and then uh, if you don't want to use your phone, but you want to use your laptop or computer, you can use the uh, web address that you see join at uh, in the lower left at slido.com. And then that you need that full number and that'll get you into the session we're at. So um, as stated, my name is Michael Fulmer. I am the Warning Coordination Meteorologist at the Ocean Prediction Center. That's just a fancy way of saying that I deal with the public now, uh, as opposed to just forecasting. I still forecast quite a bit, um, but it is my job to go around uh, for outreach to communicate with our end users. And that can be even uh, something similar to this, where I get to talk to the public about what we do. So the first question, as you see here, is where do you get your weather forecasts and information? I'll leave it up for just another uh, couple minutes to see if anyone else wants to chime in. Uh, but it's pretty much as I would expect here. Uh, we have some National Weather Service, weather apps. Uh, weather apps have definitely literally brought the weather to your hands. Uh, weather Underground, okay, there you go. Radar Scope, uh, OPC, that's, that's always makes me happy. And then your local news channels, um, you know, one of the great things about the local news channels, Weather Underground, a lot of the apps you use is that there's an interface that works with and alongside the National Weather Service. So it's a great way to get our information uh, out to the public in, in a broader scope. So give me about another minute here, and then I will jump into the presentation. But I hope you all enjoy this uh, this is my way of testing it out. We have a workshop coming up uh, for Mariners in DC, uh, third week, roughly middle of April. And so we're testing out, uh, I'm getting to test this out today. So you're all my guinea pigs. Thank you very much. I've done it once before, but it was a couple of years ago. So, all right, we have a few other things. Coco Rise, 6ABC. Uh, I'm trying to remember if 6ABC, is that Philly? I don't know if anyone can answer that for me, but um, yeah, was, that's a Philadelphia station. I, I thought so. I remember ABC in New York, I believe was seven. Um, so this goes to show I'm proving that I'm really from the area. So. Well, yeah. <laughs> this is a quiz. I'm, not, I'm not just saying that I am from New Jersey. I really am a Jersey Shore guy, even though I've lost a little bit of my accent along the way. All right. Well, with that, thank you everyone for participating. Uh, keep those phones and computers nearby. As promised, we will have multiple questions throughout. So uh, I hope you enjoy this. So I'm going to move on here. And as I said, I am the Warner Coordination Meteorologist. I want to uh, especially thank uh, my colleague, uh, Jake Bird, who is one of the forecasters at uh, OPC, and then Darren Fergurski, who's my boss. He's the one I have to answer to. And on the left here, you see this animation, I hope it's animating for you, of a large cyclone. This is a non-tropical cold weather. Uh, as you can see, it's March 14th of 2022. A very powerful storm just to the east side of Greenland. And I think you can see my pointer when I do this. Um, but right around here, you get a lot of interesting features. This is the Davis Straits. Baffin Bay is a little farther north. You have Labrador, Newfoundland, and then this part of Greenland, and this is a known hazard area for strong winds right at the tip of Greenland. 
uh, where we have many uh, strong storm force and hurricane force events throughout the year. Uh, so it's always a fun little animation to start with. So who is OPC? Who is the Ocean Prediction Center? Well, we issue marine warnings, forecasting guidance in multiple forms, as you see here, text, graphical, as well as gridded format. Uh, we focus in the Atlantic north of 31 degrees north and in the Pacific north of 30 degrees north. Uh, the strange difference is actually due to, of all things, the shape of Florida. So the reason why we start at 31 north in the Atlantic is because that little piece of Florida north of Jacksonville juts a little bit above 30 degrees north. Uh, we are 24-7, 365 operation with 20 marine forecasters when we are fully staffed. Uh, we have five operational desks every day. We have not been, by the way, uh, fully staffed in many years, but I'm proud to say as of this moment, even if it's temporary, we are on our way to be fully staffed and I might be able to get off of shift long enough to do some uh, of my real work. Uh, but as you can see in the photo here, this is our building in College Park, Maryland. Uh, it's a beautiful new building that we moved into in, I believe it was 2012. Um, shortly after I started there, which was in 2011. What kind of warnings do we do? I'm trying to see. I don't know if you can see this. I'm trying to get rid of why it's doing that. All right, I apologize. I was trying to get rid of the top bar. I don't know why it decided to stick out. Uh, the OPC Marine Warnings. They are gale, storm force, as well as hurricane force. And then we also issue warnings for freezing spray. And those are the categories. So gale, this is all based on the Beaufort scale. Uh, so gale, 34 to 47 knots, uh, storm force, 48 to 63 knots. And then hurricane force, just like a regular hurricane, is greater than or equal to 64 knots. Uh, freezing spray, as you can see on this tug, is uh, pretty significant. It is a very important uh, feature that we have to forecast in the winter uh, and transitional seasons. Uh, they can take ships down. For the Atlantic forecast area, uh, to the north of 31 North, anywhere in the blue, this is the area of responsibility for the Ocean Prediction Center. These are our high seas all the way up to Greenland and to 35 West. The dark blues are what are called our offshore zones, so we get a little more finer detail in those forecast I'm sure you can imagine there's a lot of uh, boating and shipping traffic that occurs here as uh, ships return to port or leave port. Uh, to the south of here, you have the Tropical Analysis and Forecast Branch at the National Hurricane Center, and they their high offshore areas are the darker green and their high seas is the lighter green, again, going out to 35 west. Uh, anything in pink or salmon color would be the local National Weather Service forecast areas. Their, their responsibilities are what are called the near shores. And they go out to approximately 60 nautical miles. We then extend it out to 250 nautical miles. And then the rest, as I said, is all put into a high seas product. On the Pacific side, fairly similar, but now we're at 30 north. And you can see again in the blue, large area of responsibility for the Ocean Prediction Center in the lighter blue. The darker blues are our offshore zones again. And then uh, the National Hurricane Center takes care of offshore zones next to Mexico. A lot of this I've learned recently is due to Coast Guard activity when they're assisting with uh, the Mexican government. Uh, and then this extends just a little bit south about uh, just shy of five degrees south uh, in the Pacific. The areas in purple are run by the Honolulu Forecast Office, and they do the same thing. The darker purples are their offshore zones, and the pinks are their local nearshore zones. And then Alaska, as you can see, there's a lot of territory here, and we cover a lot of it. We overlap as well and coordinate with the offices, but Alaska takes care for, for now a lot of these areas, including the Arctic Ocean when it is open from ice. So now we get to the next question here. If the average, it's supposed to say the, I did this while I was half asleep in the middle of the night, so I apologize. If the average hurricane season in the Atlantic produces seven hurricanes, how many non-tropical hurricane force lows occurred during the winter time? And I gave you a few options to choose from. 
So this should have popped right up on your phone if you kept that open. Your options are 7, 18, 45, 62, and 100. And I'll wait a little bit here and see uh, how, how the answers uh, come in. And I'm going to take a quick drink of water. That's how you know I'm from New Jersey. I said water instead of water. All right, I see seven answers so far. Don't be shy. No one's going to know if you're wrong. No one's going to know if you're right. But you can cheer, I guess, in the chat if you would like. And I'll give it another couple more minutes, or not a couple more minutes, sorry, a few more seconds. All righty. So again, the Atlantic on average produces approximately seven hurricanes a season. Out of the roughly 13 or so named storms on average. But we have many, many non-tropical hurricane force lows. So let's look at the answers. 50% were at 18. 38% of the answers at 45 and 13% at 7. The correct answer, as you can see, highlighted is 45. That's a lot of hurricane force lows. We could not name them all because we'd go through multiple versions of the alphabet uh, in every winter. So when you look at where all these hurricane force lows occur on average, uh, the Atlantic is on the top here. You can see quite a bit of activity, as I noted, near Greenland, but you get quite a bit in the uh, Davis Straits. And then there is this particularly concerning patch that starts near the East Coast and extends out to the south of Nova Scotia and Newfoundland. And these little ant-like features here, if you see these little red stippled tracks are the primary shipping routes across the Atlantic. And you can see they cross quite a bit of this hurricane force territory. So a lot of activity occurs in this area. The Pacific on average, about 38 hurricane force events with a bigger concentration just to the east of Japan. Uh, I would ask, uh, but I'd have no way to get your answer. There's a primary current out here called the Kuryoshio current. And it's just a hotbed for uh, hurricane force lows. Again, the main shipping routes, uh, you have two primary ones that go across the North Pacific and a farther north one out of Seattle, uh, using the Aleutians as a bit of a buffer at times. Um, but yeah, a lot of, lot of big storms occur where a lot of your products, such as cars, clothing, sometimes food, all these different things, uh, maybe your new cell phone, uh, would be coming across. Uh, the oceans are still our primary method to get a lot of the products that you enjoy purchasing in the stores. So when you look at the climatology in the Pacific, we get an earlier start. October, November can be kind of busy, as you can see, but December, January, and February are very rough. Um, as you can see, in, in March, we typically back off except for a couple of years, but someone forgot to tell the uh, Pacific Ocean to stop this year. Uh, I believe we are near or above the 2015-16 numbers. Uh, it's just been a hurricane force generating, you know, machine out there. And our forecasters are quite tired. So if anyone has any connections to the Pacific, please let them know we'd like to get a break. Uh, when you look at the Atlantic, it's a little shifted to the right. Notice that there's not as much activity in the October, November timeframe, but December, January, February, again, are the hot months. March does continue into the first, at least the first half of April, where we can still be getting some hurricane force lows. May is pretty unusual. Uh, you can see the 06, 07 season had a little bit of a blip there. Uh, but then we quiet down in the summer just in time for, if we were all in person, I would say, I would hope you would say hurricane season. Yay. <laughs> so we don't get a very long break. We probably have a few weeks at most where we might be quiet enough um, to enjoy uh, slower shifts and maybe being able to eat while we're on shift. All right. So here's another one of these word cloud questions I have. What was your most memorable weather event? 
and you can answer multiple times. Uh, some of us have many different events that uh, we remember or, or um, were intimately affected by. So I'm going to give this uh, about a minute or so and give you a moment to uh, throw in some answers here. All right, I see Hurricane Irene, Sandy, Irene. March 1962, okay. Now, these are good. I was and trying to guess what would be the number one storm. From the chat, we got another Superstorm Sandy. Oh, thank you for reading those because I can't pull that down while I'm in presentation. No, yeah, don't even bother. That's fine. Yeah. Another March 62. Okay. All right. Well, as we wrap up this question, I'm I'm kind of surprised. Oh, Hugo, there we go. Um, anyone remember December 1992? It's like the forgotten nor'easter on the Jersey Shore because it was bookended by the perfect storm in '91 and the March superstorm of 1993. And that, that December 1992 storm was one of the most damaging storms along the Jersey Shore prior to Sandy. I believe for high water marks, it was, um, it was definitely a record setter. A lot of wind damage. I see Andrew lightning strike as a kid. I will admit that is how I got into meteorology. I was four years old and I was sitting on the front porch and saw our car get hit by lightning during a pretty intense thunderstorm my mom was making peanut butter and jelly sandwiches and was like oh that sounded like it was really close and my little four-year-old self had no idea how to tell her yeah it hit the car <laughs> so she found out years later when i wrote that in a essay to uh the university of miami as i was uh, getting ready to apply for schools yeah and then in the uh, in the comments we got we got uh, somebody lost their heater in that 92 flood. Yeah. And I, yeah. Um, I was living on LBI at that time. So yeah. Uh, I... That was, it was a pretty incredible storm, um, but there's been so many other big events. I'm not surprised uh, if anyone ever uh, forgets that one. Uh, March, 1962 though, prior to 1992, that was another benchmark storm, especially for LBI. Uh, one of the worst storms in LBI history right there. All right. Well, thank you for participating. I'm going to move on now. So one of our biggest things at the Ocean Prediction Center is we don't get to hear from the public a lot. Uh, that's not necessarily a bad thing. Uh, my philosophy is if we don't hear from you, we're doing our job. If we do hear from you, I don't want to answer the phone <laughs> because usually it's going to be an angry ship captain saying, hey, we're experiencing conditions that you did not have in your forecast. It has happened. We have gotten yelled at and we quickly try to fix whatever is going on. Um, sometimes it's bad observations. It could be many things. But in these upper charts up here, you will see a 96-hour uh, forecast for a hurricane force low on one day. This is on the uh, 6th of October, 2023. On the 7th of October, hurricane force low is, is well underway. And then the surface map from October 11th, um, showing the hurricane force low did in fact occur. And at that, our pressures weren't too bad. You know, 965, 965 right up here, and then 964 was the observed pressure. Very intense, very powerful storm. When you see cold fronts arcing like that, um, these are some of the biggest storms we tend to see out there, but also very busy across the eastern part of the basin. So did anyone listen to us? Well, I'm glad you asked. In the upper part, you see October 9th, this is all the live shipping traffic. Uh, we have a way to be able to see uh, how ships are maneuvering around storms. Unfortunately, we can't share it with the public, 
uh, but we do have it in-house as a way for us to uh, kind of gauge if the message is getting out. And October 11th, when the system is in full uh, strength, you see this big gap in shipping traffic. So all these vessels that are moving out here, and they're not moving very fast, right? You know, some of them have a maximum uh, speed of about 20 knots. They had to make their plans well in advance to be able to avoid this big circle here. So this is a success. This goes to show us, uh, you know, no one's there to verify, and that's not such a bad thing. Um, we'd prefer them not verify our forecast and just get out of the way. So here are just a listing of all the different products. I don't expect you to focus on any single one, but we do produce over 150 products each day. A lot of them are text products for the various different offshore zones. Uh, Vobras, which are voice over, uh, it's high frequency voice broadcast for the offshore zones. Uh, you also have these nav techs, which go out and they include the forecast all the way up to the coast out through our offshore zone. So many different ways in the US Coast Guard is the one that blasts all these out uh, to the uh, marine public. Uh, on the top here, you have 500 millibar charts. You have uh, surface charts at 24 hours through 96 hours. Uh, the 24 and 48 hours are updated twice a day. The seven, uh, yeah, the 72 and the 96 are once a day. You also have wind and wave charts as well as the wave period and direction. So we offer quite a bit for a large, large part of our uh, both Atlantic and Pacific basins. But our most popular product is this surface chart from what we have found. Uh, this is a particularly busy day. I told you December is a really rough month. Um, I'm sure many of our my forecast colleagues have other choice words to describe how bad it can get, but we will keep it uh, family friendly here and talk about how this developing hurricane force low as it's interacting. This is the Kamchatka Peninsula. It's an extension off of Siberia up here. This blue line is where the ice edge is. Uh, once a day, we get an update on that. And then you see two storm force lows, uh, a developing gale to the northeast of Hawaii, which is down here, and then a low approaching uh, Vancouver Island uh, in the Pacific Northwest area. So a lot going on, and we provide these four times a day. They're very detailed maps that include a 24-hour position of where uh, the significant weather is heading. Uh, we also include the heavy freezing spray near the ice edge uh, where that tends to occur a lot more. So a lot of detail and it seems to be, uh, again, one of the favorite products that we produce. We also do the Arctic. I won't go into a lot of detail here, but we go and analyze all the way up to the pole, uh, which is, I, again, providing 24 through 96 hour forecasts for both wind wave when there's free, uh, free or ice free areas. Um, as well as uh, the SST and Ice Edge analysis, uh, which is a little bit of a bonus product that we produce up there. And then uh, we also have an, a new branch that's been added to the Ocean Prediction Center from the US National Ice Center. It's called the OPC Ice Services Branch. So I just wanted to show you what this is about. The US National Ice Center is a three, it consists of three components. The NOAA portion, which is at OPC, the Navy component, which is fleet weather down in Norfolk. And you have the U.S. Coast Guard component, which deals with the waterways and ocean policy, uh, mobility ice operations division. All of that works together in tandem for what's called the U.S. National Ice Center in Suitland, Maryland. And they're producing products that give you actual ice edge analysis, as well as concentration at the North Pole and in the South Pole. So we, of course, focus mostly in the Northern Hemisphere, but we have parts of our um, our center that do focus on activity near Antarctica. And you can see we also have a unit with the Coast Guard, uh, NAIS, the North American Ice Service, which tracks icebergs. So if you ever see those big pictures of icebergs going by uh, Labrador and Newfoundland, uh, it's amazing for me to imagine that they are literally counting icebergs and the biggest ones they can see, which brings an interesting point. The whole reason Ocean Prediction Center exists is because of, uh, maybe you've heard of this, but uh, there was a ship called the Titanic that had a little bit of a problem as it was uh, going through some iceberg fields. So 
we exist due to the unfortunate situation that occurred uh, back when the Titanic was around. Other things we do, we have these grids, which are really nice. They're high resolution. That's where we're all going as internet expands. And you can get these really nice images that we use for our impact decision support um, products. And so these usually go to the Coast Guard. I'll show you an example of what that looks like later. So how do we do it? Well, satellite is a huge part of our um, toolbox. Uh, without satellite, it would be really hard to do any type of ocean analysis. So on the left, you have a basic, uh, well, not really basic, I don't wanna be mean, but it's, it's our high resolution visible satellite imagery. You can see a lot of interesting features like the cold front in this squiggly line ahead of the cloud shield out here and a nice well-formed uh, low pressure system. On the right, you have the low and then these low earth orbiting satellites. So these are traveling around the earth in a um, sun synchronous, what we call sun synchronous pattern, meaning the satellites never change their position. The earth just rotates underneath them. It's a really cool thing. You also have geostationary satellites, which move with the earth. So they have to be calibrated to move as the earth moves. So you have a constant picture. Well, in this case, we have an altimeter, which is able to use GPS to monitor the height of the ocean at any given moment. And you can see in the peak of this very strong storm, probably a strong storm force, maybe hurricane force low, 59 foot seas were detected by this instrument. But how do we do wind? Well, we have what are called scatterometers. Now these are fun instruments. They actually help measure the wind speed over the ocean surface. And I want you to think of a very windy day, say on the Barnegat Bay or out over the ocean, you see lots of white caps. Well, imagine you're in a full fledged storm, like a major nor'easter and those white caps start to get really foamy. You're getting a lot of sea spray. Well, this instrument can actually use that data by just sensing the surface of the water and seeing all that uh, extra foam and white cap and sea spray and give us wind speed from the amount of activity going on underneath. And in this image here, you have a hurricane force low for uh, geography here. You have Newfoundland, Labrador, you have Ireland over here and Portugal and Spain. This storm is taking up a wide area of the uh, North Atlantic with hurricane force winds, as you can see in the darker reds. When we zoom in, you can see that even though we're only getting about 12 and a half kilometer resolution, there are lots of hurricane force 65 to 70 knot wind barbs. That's how we can verify if we were in fact on the right track with the storm. If we don't see them, but we see lots of these darker reds mixed in with the browns, uh, then we can sometimes have, we have to make decisions on whether or not that is uh, classifiable as a hurricane force low. So it can get kind of tricky, but this instrument saves us a lot of heartache. Uh, instead of just using model data, uh, we're able to actually see what's going on over the ocean. And here's just a wider view. Uh, we have three different satellops. Uh, satellops. <laughs> this is my overnight shifts kicking in. Three different satellites, Metop A, Metop B, Metop C. Metop A, these are all from Europe. Uh, was decommissioned. So we're really only using these last two scatterometers for the time being. We have a brand new one that's about to, uh, it, it's already launched. It's called OceanSat. I forget which country launched it off the top of my head, uh, but we should be getting that data soon. And again, it'll help us with verifying where all these really big storms exist. So before I go into like what models we're using, Here's another, uh, now I believe you can answer this multiple times. I apologize if you cannot. Um, I may have forgot to hit that switch, but which of the following weather forecasts and models have you heard of or used? I'll give you a, a few minutes to answer here. I wouldn't even be surprised if some of you didn't know, at least one or two of these didn't exist. Um, I could have, had many, many different uh, models that go beyond this, but I figured we'd keep it under control.
I'll give a few more seconds to see if anybody else wants to answer. And Rick, if you see anyone put anything in the chat, you can please let me know. Okay. Um, one of the responses is your your foil one, two, four, and five. So that'd be the U.S. model, North American model, and uh, Canadian and UK Kingdom model. I'm not. <laughs> yep. Okay. All right. So I'm surprised and not surprised at the same time. Uh, GFS, that is our United States uh, main global model. Uh, the North American model is actually a smaller or meso scale. So meso meaning, you know, smaller scale model uh, that uses some of its initializations from the GFS. Uh, the European model was in that big battle over Hurricane Sandy um, a few years, quite a few years ago now. It's hard to believe how many years have passed since Hurricane Sandy. Uh, and then the Canadian model. And yes, UK Met is another one that we use. The HER, which is a high-res rapid refresh. That's for uh, forecast within the next 18 to as much as 36 hours. Um, and it's very useful for what we call now casting. When you're trying to figure out, okay, I already have thunderstorms where are they going or give me an idea of where they might be headed so I can warn the public. So, all right. Thank you again for participating. So we go to the next slide. So what does forecasting look like for us? Well, we have many different models, as you saw to choose from. This one is the GFS and these are three consecutive runs showing low pressure off the mid-Atlantic New Jersey coastline. And the oldest run is in the blue and the newest run is in the red. And you can see how there's some little oscillating back and forth with this model. But if I show you the European model for the same storm, you would sit there and scratch your head and go, wait, what did I miss? Okay, blue, much farther offshore, Green, way out to sea. Red, now we're near the North Carolina coast. This really makes forecasting a challenge. And knowing which model to use and their different biases can get very tricky. So I like to put this disclaimer out there. And it's not pointing fingers at anybody, but just to, you know, with the advent of all the different technologies we have today, it's very easy to pull up model data on your phone. Um, and I just say, be very cautious. So usually you know, most of the forecasters that are going to be looking at this have the specialized knowledge to be able to assess and communicate the hazards uh, to the marine uh, community. The computer models, though, they are not forecasts. They are guidance tools. You know, a lot of people use them as forecasts, but there are things that can go way wrong. And if you've noticed a trend, that trend isn't going to show up if you pull up a model on your phone. So uh, please trust that, you know, we're not just talking because we want to save our jobs we want to save you and uh, be very careful when you're looking at the model data it's still fun to look at uh, i'm sure many of you have seen on facebook or twitter people love to you know show us snowstorms that are you know 15 days away and then we get to that 15th day and uh it was sunny and there wasn't even enough cold air to make ice outside so <laughs> As you can see, I'm also very disgruntled because we haven't had a true winter in so long anymore. <laughs> but anyway, moving on to the next. So observations, very important. Uh, in this particular case here, though, please do not ever take your boat or uh, larger vessel out to storm chase. I don't know what this ship was doing at the time. I cannot speak for them. But what you're seeing here is 65 knot winds being reported by the ship right at the tip of what we call the little comma head. If you can see, you actually see this little bit of a haze. That's sea spray. That is a true sign that you have hurricane force winds actually ripping the water, ripping the top layer of water off the ocean surface. Uh, it's absolutely amazing. But what this ship was able to do was help us with where exactly the center of low pressure was, because when we look at the model data, oops, the model was not anywhere near where 
the sh the ship probably thought it was going to be and where uh you know we would have initialized so again going back that's a very significant situation where um that unfortunate uh ship was in the wrong place at the wrong time so observations are key in helping to correct where the model initializations give us a start when it comes to observations what does that look like oh well if you look over uh, to the left here, you'll notice that over land, we got so many great observations. Yes, there's some holes in here, you know, some areas that we wish we could have even uh, denser observations. Um, look at the Jersey Shore, for instance, you know, as we get to the Mesonet portion, you'll notice, oh, well, there's really nothing in Ocean County. Uh, there is Robert J. Miller, but I guess that day wasn't working, um, which by the way is kind of normal. Um, but Atlantic City is there, Belmar is up here. So you have a few, and you have one down here in Cape May. Um, it might be like a Wildwood, I think that's Wildwood. Uh, but anyway, you have a few buoy observations in the orangish color, and then the ships are in the blue. If I expand out, eh, there's a few more observations, but not getting any better. I mean, wow, look how dense that area is over land. Really beautiful, right? Oh, let's go even farther out uh wait a minute where's all my observations here in the middle of the atlantic ocean there's really not much you have a few ships on the way to save the day uh we do have some aircraft that give you upper levels but as far as surface that doesn't really help us either and then you get to europe and oh look we have observations again including uh in the azores the canary islands you have bermuda right here but so satellite is our main tool <clears throat> That's one of the things I want to drive home there. When it does come to ship traffic, you'll see the Atlantic has fairly decent coverage across the middle part. Uh, but look how very little data is available in the rest of the world. So once again, without any satellite imagery, we would be sunk. And I don't mean that uh, to be a joke, um, but it is very true. It'd be really tough to do our job. So... This is just a fun one I thought I'd throw in. How often do you go out on a boat, ship, or a cruise? I'll give you a few seconds to answer this. I'm uh, looking at my cell phone and I'm not getting these different foils that you have up. You aren't. No. What is yeah. it showing you, Rick? Uh, it just has uh, ask the speaker, type your question. Um, oh, on the top, it might have you in the Q&A. Do you see where you can flip between Q&A? And... Yep, 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 got okay. it. See, the, the Italian part of me using my hands to try to show yeah. people is not very helpful in this venue. <laughs> All right, so it looks like a few times a year. Um, I think I would have expected that weekly. I wish I had the opportunity, me too, I'm with everybody. Uh, monthly even, and even at least a couple answers of every day. Uh, for you that can go out every day, I envy. I would love to be out on, on the water as much as possible. But um, yeah, I thought this would just be kind of fun so I can gauge a little bit of uh, how attuned everyone is to being out on the water. So thank you again. So when it comes to our decision support services, uh, we provide these updates to the Coast Guard. Here's an example of a storm force event ahead of a very strong cold front with what looks to be a bit of a wave on the front. You can see the storm force wind. So we took this from our grids that we create um, and create the images with a software that we then put into these uh, quick PDF files that we send to the Coast Guard. The Coast Guard then blasts that out to a listserv. So if you are a mariner that frequents the areas offshore of the Atlantic or even the Pacific, um, get in touch with me and there's a way you can sign up to get these blasts from the Coast Guard. Uh, we cannot send it to you directly. 
it would have to be uh, Coast Guard is in charge of all of our uh, communication to the Marine community or, or the majority of it. Do they have, um, uh, Michael, do they, does the Coast Guard have those posted um, at a website? So one of the things I plan to do in my new position is to host it on our website. We're not there yet. It requires some uh, systemic changes. Okay. Got it. Uh, so for now, it's the email blast that they provide. Um, but I am working on it, so I, I could update you when that's available, because I'm sure there's more of a community that would enjoy seeing these when there's significant weather expected, um, yeah. especially for your crabbing and fishing that go out a, a little bit closer to the Gulf Stream, for instance. And you can see on the West Coast, we do the same thing. So this is a gale. This is a, a very semi-permanent type of gale that occurs, especially in the summer when you have really big high pressure to the west of the west coast. You get these uh, wind events that occur due to the uh, lower pressures over land because it heats up very quickly in the cool ocean current out here, and then the terrain. So all of those features come together to produce this uh, very pronounced area of usually low end gales, like 35, maybe 40 knots, but they occasionally can get up to storm force, depending on how strong the high pressure is. And just so, just as a time hack, we're like, uh, we've got about 15 minutes left. And okay. I think, you know, if you wanted to be talking about the near shore or more the the Jersey waters, um, we've yep. got, that's the kind of time we have. That, no, thank you very much. I enjoy that. I actually am at the end of the OPC part. So there you go. Great. That, that was great timing. <laughs> so, we do these high seas forecasts that are currently text. This is really quick just to say we're going to start get, not getting rid of or phasing out the text going for more of these visual products, as you can see in the lower left down here, where what we call polygons. And I think that the majority of uh, mariners are going to enjoy seeing a picture, which is worth a thousand words, as I'm sure you can all agree, as well as, you know, even farther offshore um, for these big storms out over the Pacific. So with that, this is the end of the Ocean Prediction Center uh, portion, but just to show you this awesome animation here and the fact that we are constantly looking at ways to improve our work, improve our forecasts, and utilize uh, all these great fun tools. Uh, for us in meteorology, they're fun tools and they're really life-saving though when it comes to the public side. So the Jersey Shore Mesonet Project. Um, this is something that was started a few years ago. Uh, I will go into some of that, but I wanted to first ask you, have you ever heard of a mesonet before today? Now we start to get into some really fun questions. Uh, if you like nerdy weather questions, you're gonna like this section a lot. All right, so majority of answers so far are no. <laughs> yep, and same, same with the uh, chat. Okay. <laughs> I see maybe at least a couple of yeses in there, um, but the no's look like they are dominating. I am not surprised. That's not. There's nothing wrong with that. I'm going to quickly teach you what this is. So why have a mesonet? Well, it is a network of weather stations. Uh, they don't necessarily have to talk to each other. They have to talk to me or a meteorologist like me, who then can compile the data and create fun graphs and tables and things like that for you to enjoy uh, or use for your work, uh, your personal, whatever it is that you need. Uh, but they also can assist the National Weather Service with some verification when there's no other data available. Providing the valuable data of rainfall, wind, temperature for the research projects. Uh, Mates uh, has been able to use some of the data in the past. Uh, John Wenick, I think, uses quite a bit for uh, the Terrapin projects he's been involved in. Uh, and the field station has started to use them quite a bit uh, down in uh, down the road, um, providing an opportunity for students to use the weather data and providing mariners locally, whether they be recreational or professional, a chance to use the data, especially because we're near water. So what inspired this? Well, this might look familiar. Um, I won't ask you what storm, because I think once you see where it ends up, you're going to know right away what storm this was. But Hurricane Sandy was a very big deal um, for the Jersey Shore. And uh, I don't need to tell anybody that, but uh, our first weather stations were put into place in August of 2012, and then Sandy got rid of them for me. So 
Little did I know that when we started this project, we would immediately be impacted by one of the most historical events on record. So with that, what was the last hurricane? I want you to focus on that last hurricane to make landfall in New Jersey. It might sound like a trick question, but I'm going to let you answer before I reveal which one it was. All of these, by the way, I'm not cheating. All of these affected New Jersey. I'm sure at least a few of you will know that. So I'm going to give this a few seconds. I see one person answering. Don't be shy. Again, there's no way for me to know if you're right or wrong, so it's all good. All right, I see nine participants. Uh, before I get to it, uh, Rick, were there any answers in the chat? Um, chat, we've got the Floyd. Floyd, okay. The answer is Hurricane Irene. Irene was the last hurricane to make landfall. It was a hurricane at landfall. Sandy was not a hurricane, although that's still debatable, I'm sure, in some circles. Gloria was a glancing blow. That is one of the storms that got me into meteorology, but it actually made landfall in Long Island. Uh, and technically, Floyd made landfall in New Jersey, but it was a tropical storm. <laughs> so Irene gets the... Uh, Actual, here's the satellite image of Irene's track uh, as it went up the coast. And it made landfall uh, in the south central Jersey coast before heading up into New York City. Uh, out in our area, for instance, it produced about 10 to 15 inches of rain. And a lot of the wind was along the coast. So that brings up another question. What city in New Jersey was the landfall point for both Hurricane Irene and post-tropical storm Sandy. So back-to-back -back years, the same city was the landfall location. Which, by the way, from a historical perspective, is insane. It is really hard to hit the same place twice. All right, I'm well, almost we'll seeing everyone's answered. On the chat, we've got a brigantine. Okay. And the final answer is, I hope you've all answered, brigantine. I am very <laughs> impressed. Congratulations. <laughs> Pat yourselves on the back. Wildwood was close. Beach Haven was close. Belmar, not as close, but it was affected, and I'm glad no one picked Tom's River. <laughs> um, as much as maybe when I was a kid, I'd be like, oh, it'd be cool to have the eye of a storm go over Tom's River, you know, it's because I, I lived there. Um, nope, Brigantine was the unfortunate location for both storms, um, which again is just meteorologically that's wild. So we also have uh systems like this one. Uh, this occurred in January of 2018. You might remember this, this was a powerful nor'easter. Um, that charged up the coast, creating a lot of snowfall right along the Jersey Shore. Again, another inspiration for us having this mesonet. So here's where we are right now. Uh, we started approximately 13 years ago with three sites. We were at the Ocean County Vocational Technical School in Waretown, the Mates Academy in Manahawkin and Sedge Island, uh, which has been an ongoing project with them since the beginning. Sedge Island took the brunt of Sandy. Uh, we believe had wind gusts over 80 before it just lost. We lost everything. Um, and we also lost mates in that storm. Believe it or not, Weartown survived. It was the only remaining station after Sandy. Uh, currently, we have 10 active sites, one inactive site, and two future sites. So as you can see, the 10 uh, include the LBI Foundation, but it's also the uh, LBT field station, Sedge Island, Bathhouse, Mates, Stafford Township Municipal is now involved, Beachwood, Ocean Gate, Save Barnegat Bay, as well as the Bayhead Fire Company. Um, really happy to have them join us. Uh, they are our farthest north uh, point at this time. Weartown, unfortunately, the station got old. It hit the 10 year mark and then just died on us. So we are hoping for a replacement. And our next station to be installed very, very soon is Seaside Park Yacht Club. 
and we have a possible location in Point Pleasant Beach. When this slide set is ready, uh, you can click on that link. It is a hyperlink to a Google Earth image, and you can see where all these sites are, as well as you can toggle on and off to see where we are looking to put sites. So if you're interested, please reach out to me. But we provide these monthly summaries. Um, I think, Rick, for instance, you've been able to see these I, yep. I, around my list. Uh, but where I'll put here was February of this year. You know, the high temperature, low temperature, average temperature for the month and what the departure was. So we were 1.7 degrees above normal. Precip was below normal. And year to date, uh, that should be green. We were actually above normal. And maximum wind gust uh, was actually on the 28th of February at 55 miles an hour. That was right there at the foundation. Uh, and then I also include graphs because I think, again, pictures are worth a thousand words. You can see where the rainfall is, but if you match up the, the dates with the temperature falls, notice that's where your strongest winds are occurring. These are some pretty robust uh, cold fronts, uh, especially at the end of the month with this just really drastic drop in temperature. I also do summaries for the seasons. So for, uh, again, LBI Foundation, uh, the average temperature for winter was 1.9 degrees above normal, and we were 0.96 inches above normal on rainfall. Uh, again, highest wind gust was February, and I also break down, you know, how many highs were above 50 and how many lows were below 32. I break it down more if you want more information. And here were the temperature trends as well as the precipitation trends based uh, uh, compared to normal during that time. So another quiz question, how much snow fell in the LBI area during the winter that we just ended on February 29th? I know the weather still thinks it's winter, but in meteorology, we use December, January, and February as our winter snowfall months. I'll give it a few seconds. And Rick, I'm getting very close to the end here. Okay. Any answers on the chat? Uh, one, um, 3.7. Okay. All right. Has everyone answered? All right. For sake of time, I'm going to just go and give you the answer. 8.3. 8.3 inches of snow for the entire winter period. 3.7 wasn't that bad, though. <laughs> so in order to come up with that number, hmm. no one is standing outside at the foundation to measure snow. Um, I would love to talk to someone if they want to take local measurements of snow when they're in town. Uh, maybe Rick, you and I can talk about that down the road. So I had to use what's called Coca Ross, which I know was mentioned earlier. Uh, that is a great community effort to try to get the most snowfall and, and rainfall measurements possible. Um and 8.3 was the closest I could find to LBI. It's possible it was a little below that, but I have no way to verify. All right. And then we do a yearly roundup. I'm not going to go through all these numbers, but it kind of gives you an idea looking at 2023, highest temperature at the foundation, 91, lowest 11.7, the dates they occurred. The total precip, I think, is the one that really stuck out to me, 11.32 um, inches below normal. And based on what I was seeing, that wasn't a mistake because the uh, the field station, Sedge Island, and the uh, bathhouse were all well below normal. But if you hopped across the bay, you were closer to normal. It was less of a deficit. So the barrier islands really took a big drought. Um, that wasn't showing up on any drought monitors. I think this is where this information gets to be really, really important. Warmest month relative to average, January. Coldest month, June. Who saw that one? Who had that on their bingo card? Okay, what was the least snowy winter in New Jersey Shore history? I can hear everyone's brains thinking here. <laughs> yeah. I, well, threw in some, I threw in some tough ones, so this is a good one. 
while you're uh, while you're doing that um one on the uh, chat is 20 2022 and 23 okay and also uh in the chat just while you're waiting i'm going to read a couple of things darlene reminded everybody that that coco rise um uh there is a link to that and that is for citizens to make uh, meteorological uh, observations and record them and to be part of that, which is kind of a, a very cool and helpful thing. Absolutely. And then uh, she also mentioned a link out to NOAA. And uh, by the way, all these links will be out at the foundation's website. And, and I also do, while I'm talking, I'll give a shout out uh, to Michael because back when we established our uh, weather station, we needed to interface it to the network. And there was some problem with that. And the budget was tight and one thing or another. And Michael, out of his own pocket, <laughs> found the money to enable the foundation to be, have its station online. Uh, we've since, I think, got a little bit of budget to be able to do those kinds yeah. of things. But thank you very much, Michael. That was a no, I mean, and yeah. it's worked. That's what matters, right? <laughs> the change we made was necessary. And we've been, your site has been very reliable. Um, I, I'm very proud to say that. Um, and I'm proud to have that partnership. So thank you. All right. And I know, okay. again, well, well, kind of like as we're wrapping down, people are putting in their last things. I want to remind everyone that, that the weather station at the foundation is online for you. So you can just go out to the science part of the website and there is a link to click on to the weather station, and then you can see those charts. And um, they they do a weekly. Uh, actually, you can you can go back to over a month. You can you can take a look at the data over uh, a period of time, and uh, it's very useful and it's kind of fun. And also remind people that the the there is a cam camera pointing on the marsh, so you can see storms come in, see the interaction with the marsh, and then. Also see the bar barometric pressure drop, the um, the wind shifts, and and those kinds of things. Yeah, I I love that you have a camera. I wish every site had a camera. <laughs> yeah, that'd be really cool. Okay, so what's the answer here? 2022, 2023, You are correct for all of those that chose that. Uh, just so you know, the Jersey Shore saw 0. 0.1 inches, which is the least amount of snow ever recorded in the entire historical database. <laughs> so you witness we've all were witness to history for the least snowy winter in our lifetimes <laughs> and in the lifetimes of many others all right so i'm going to wrap it up here and just say that you know we these are some of the graphs that i wind up producing for the year-end review um some of the highest wind gusts um i'll, I'll do these last couple of questions rick because i just think people will have fun with yeah. it and then we can we can be done i only i think there's only two what was the highest wind gust on the Jersey Shore Mesonet this past winter? So go ahead and answer. Actually, I think you you divulged that answer in one of your slides, if I'm not mistaken. Mm, I guess we'll have to see, huh? <laughs> All right, if anyone on the chat had one, I don't want to leave them out. Um, there's a 55 on the chat. All right. You guys ready for the answer? Yeah. 72 miles an hour. That was at, uh, so 55 was at your station. 72 on the same day occurred at the bathhouse in Island Beach State Park and was the notable wind gust in all of New Jersey for that event. I'm very proud of that particular <laughs> statement our mesonet made the national weather service final review and made all the news up and down the coast it made new york news it made philadelphia news so you can be proud to be part of a mesonet where our data actually matters and it actually is getting into the historical database so uh, congratulations to all of us for that one uh, these are just some rainfall graphs. please look at them when you get a chance um, i showed a trend in rainfall if you go from right to left since the 90s, at least since 1991, up until 2021, you can see the trend in that rainfall has actually been increasing. A whole other talk, I could describe why that may be occurring.
but we don't have time for that. So if you ever want to be a part of the Mesonet, um, please look at the uh, slides uh, when they're available online and feel free to contact me or Britta. I want to end with where do we go from here? This is our current as of this morning. I pulled this down. This is the current sea surface temperature anomalies around the world. All right. And you see the date at the top was March 28th. That's when it was compiled. A couple things to note here. The El Nino is still holding on, but the cold water is trying to surface near the Galapagos. You have a nice cool ring out here and look how warm that Atlantic is. This is danger zone if this collapses fast. All right. So with that said, the final question and the end of my presentation, how many hurricanes do you think the Atlantic will produce in 2024? And I gave you them in ranges so that no one had to like pick numbers. And by hurricanes, you mean named storms? Named hurricanes, yes. I could have done just storms, but let's let's hmm. stick to the hurricanes here. And again, while you're waiting for that to to come in, uh, we are just sort of up against the time thing. Yep. Uh, and for those of you who have a question or two, Michael did say he can hang on for another five minutes. So yeah. if we have some questions, we can we can dive into those. I want to thank everybody. Uh, as I've said in the past, my gauge is we had exactly the same number of people on at the end as we had in the beginning. And so, Michael, I give people an A for that. Nobody Absolutely. left. Yeah. Uh, in fact, we picked up a couple along the way. So I think that's 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 really a, a, a good sign. And I'm just going to, those who want to drop off, I just remind everybody that next week we have Devin Haynes. She is from uh, the DEP. And she's going to be talking about several things. But the main focus is going to be the efforts the DEP is undertaking to reduce marine balloon debris, which is kind of one of my bothers me no end to see all these balloons that are strangling our animals. Uh, so that's that's her talk. Back to back to the number. So there's no answer to this. This is something I'm going to hold. <laughs> what's what's and the we'll prediction? see who's right at the end of the hurricane season because I have no idea, but. My my gut call is that the total number of named storms could be over 30 this year. Could be. Not saying it will be. But the number of hurricanes, yeah, I tend to, th I, I like the numbers that are up here, 10 to 15 or 15 to 20. Um, if that warm water does not get dissipated between now and June 1st, which most likely it'll be hard to do, uh, we could be in for quite a hurricane season. So please have your hurricane readiness kits ready because I know New Jersey, it's been a while, but um, I will end it there. And and thank you very much, Rick and, and everyone else, Jenna and the rest of the team. Uh, this was fun to put together. Uh, I was really happy to be able to hopefully give you some new information today. Well, we sure appreciate that. There are a bunch of thank yous and, and well wishes and great job. And those things coming into the, thank you. the chat uh, back as we were getting started before the class actually started and I was talking to Michael, what we talked about is having a session in the fall so he can hold those, those guesses for the, uh, for the estimate and then see what the fall estimate of storms will be. So I think that'll be worthwhile and we'll need to pick a time, Michael, when, uh, when you won't be having to work overnight. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I had a, a couple uh, points and I'm a, I'm a weather geek, but uh, when you were showing those, the surface charts, and then the 500 millibar charts. Very simple explanation. Could you just explain to people what the what the difference is in those two? Sure. In those two charts. All right. So, do you want me to go to the slides or just explain? Um, it? Well, if you can back up to that slide, that would be really helpful. It was. Oh, you know, I don't know whether you can back up that far or not, but um, I think people are like you look at weather charts and. And just a couple of those things, if you could talk, show the the cold front. I think there was an occluded front in there. Yes. Um, and then I think the, the big question is when they hear about 
a weather map and they see a weather map and understanding that there is a thing called a surface and another one that's 500 millibar with those. Yeah, there you go. Okay. So I'm going to leave it in this form as opposed to presentation form because it'll yeah. be easier to explain. So I know these are very small thumbnails up here. The 500 millibar charts, that is weather that's occurring at 20,000 feet approximately. Okay. So pretty high up there, uh, but a lot of your cold air um, versus warm air. So cold air would be what we call a trough. Warm air would be what we call a ridge. And those bubbles of air, so the bubble would be the warm, and then the troughing would be the cold push. That's what helps balance the planet so that we can continue to live here. So as those move around, weather occurs underneath that closer to the actual surface. So when we're talking about surface features, as in this map, this is what's happening within 10 meters up to maybe uh, 50 to 100 meters. All right, so pretty close to the, the surface of the earth. And if you have a strong, in this case, you have a big hurricane force low here, you have a, a 500 millibars, you'd have what's called a trough. If you see how I'm, I'm swinging the cursor here, mm -hmm. that would be underneath and the storm would be embedded or near the front edge of the trough. Then you see where this big high is down here, that 1035 high, you would have a bubble or a ridge that looks like this. And then another trough, which here is complicated because you have one strong area here, another one down here. And that trough is broad as this low goes through. So what's happening at 500 millibars or 20,000 feet has direct impacts on what you experience in the real-time weather. And then the real-time weather is what we put on these charts. This is where you would look to see when's that cold front coming through? When's it gonna rain? Uh, or I'm in a nor'easter, let's say you were living in Kamchatka, this would be a really bad day. <laughs> it would be, in this case, it's probably snowing very hard um, because they're they're pretty far north. But I hope that kind of explains it a little bit. Yeah, that's and that, that that was that's just enough. I mean, I I hope that maybe we do this again. We could even have a little weather precursor and explain what the different colors mean and uh, yeah. The, the millibars um and what the gradients are and those things but uh but that that's that was it that was all that i that was all that i needed for right then all right um and the other question that i had was oh when you were talking about the problems of people taking a look at let's say the the uh uh america uh, us um uh model and then the uk model or the european model and looking at those, you meant you were saying, well, you got to be careful about doing that. I guess uh, the word might be intuitive or an intuition. When a when you are looking at those models, then you're baking in things that you know about the the models and things that you know about the weather conditions and things that you just know from history. And that's what the tough part of the job is. Is that right? I mean, what, how do you do that? So we do a lot of what's called blending. For instance, where an area of low pressure is, I'm, I'm going to use this example up here near Kamchatka again, just because it's a nice big storm, all right? When you are three days in advance, all right, the question we need to ask ourselves is, will the storm end up here in the vicinity or is it going to be way off? Is it going to slip far south? You know, or is it not even going to form at all? So what we wind up doing is using a lot of the different models together and then picking midpoints and averages until we get closer to the event. As we get closer to the event, the confidence increases, but we can also take into account, remember I was talking about 500 millibars. The reason why meteorologists use 500 millibars so much and the 20,000 foot level is because if something doesn't make sense in the models at that level, then I can't believe what it's telling me going to happen at the surface. All right. I don't want low pressure where it thinks a ridge is going to be, you know, where it thinks high pressure aloft, high pressure aloft and a strong load that makes no sense. And sometimes models make mistakes. They're not perfect. You know, they wind up uh, calculating all these different variables. 
to get us a, a solution that then we need to look at and say, does this look real? Uh, does this fit with the overall pattern? So yeah, the human forecaster takes in their knowledge of patterns of how, uh, you know, if, if, if you've had a certain pattern persisting, you know, if you've had storm after storm after storm, and then the GFS decides, well, I'm going to stop it here. And the European says, no, no, no. I'm going to continue the storm pattern. You would tend to go with the storm pattern continuing, right? Because that's what history has showed the, the short-term history. So yes, we're, we're using a lot of that. We, we do a lot of pass down notes to each other. <laughs> uh, we talk a lot to each other we can't do it alone. So it's a team effort and that's something you don't get on a weather app. It's, it's just, you know, again, not trying to compete with them, just trying right. to be realistic and explaining why you look at a forecast one minute and then it changes drastically. That's why, because they're relying on just the model. I hope Good. I explained that okay. Yep, right. yep, that's great. All right, well, uh, we still have virtually everyone's hung in there even for the, the after session. So I really appreciate that. I really appreciate the time you took. And uh, thanks again, everybody, and see you next Saturday. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you, Michael, for such an interactive discussion. Thank you, Rick. Have a great weekend. Okay. No problem. Rick, thank you very much. This was fun. Yeah. So give me a give me a buzz. We'll talk further about uh, fixing the, the station. Okay. Sounds good. Great. Bye-bye. Right, Have a good weekend.